welcome to uh, a very first uh, for my channel. Uh, I'm going to be recording every lecture uh, for my classes, so we want to get started just kind of introing that. So at the beginning of every one of my notes, and these will all be available through my Facebook page, uh, Human Anatomy and Physiology Education. I'll be sharing that with you guys in the comments. Uh, but what we want to start off with is every lecture note of mine uh, begins with a quote. And I wanted to start this one was, I never said it'd be easy. I only said it'd be worth it. And that's what uh, your studies are going to be. They will be worth it. They won't be easy, but they will be worth it. So let's get into this. Um, through all of my notes, I always like to outline particular learning objectives that I will be teaching and testing on throughout my courses. And that's what that's showing. So really, let's just get into this and look at anatomy and physiology and what is it. As this is a foundational course for um, uh, healthcare related fields, uh, you need to understand uh, these two fundamental concepts, anatomy and physiology. And to get an idea, I like to think about the human body like it's a machine. So if we think about the human body like it's a machine, we want to think that anatomy is the, the parts, the pieces. So just as if you were a mechanic and you were going to be working on someone's car, you would need to know what the different parts were, being able to identify them, know where they would be, uh, have an understanding of what looks right and what looks wrong, so you know that part needs to be replaced. And the same thing goes in the human body. If we want to study the structures of the human body, those parts, those pieces of the machine, where physiology is the job it does, how that machine works, how these different piece parts integrate, how they do the job, how they work. And it's also very important that we understand that these two come together. These two fundamental concepts of anatomy and physiology are highly related. As I always like to say, form fits function. Uh, the structure of the thing determines the function of the thing. And if you think about it, you really wouldn't want to eat peas with a hammer or drive a nail with a fork. Uh, you have the anatomy of something determines the physiology of the thing. The structure of something determines its function. So a very important intertwined connection there. And also, we need to have an understanding of how anatomy gets studied, the levels that we can study this at. Uh, the first thing is gross anatomy. In gross anatomy, as you can hear the word macroscopic. When I say macroscopic, I'm talking about big things. This would be the study of organs, very large structures, things you could see with, with the naked eye, things you could see with your unaided eye. Um, so this would be like if you're identifying the liver and its parts where microscopic anatomy would be looking at very tiny structures, very small things that you cannot see with the naked eye, with the unaided eye. This would be things like cells and tissues. So cells, we have the study of cells being cytology. Cyto begins with a C as cell. Cyto, this prefix, refers to cells. Histo, this prefix, refers to tissues. Histology is the study of tissues. So if you think about this, so one of the ways I usually help students remember that histology, histamines, are things that make you need tissues to blow your nose on. So histology, the study of tissues. As we also think about that, we got to think about what life is. Now, in a biology course, we might talk about some things that living things are, living things aren't, and characteristics of life. Now, one of which I talk about in a biology course is not on here, but we want to look at how do we know that a patient is alive? Well, we would know our patient's alive because they would have responsiveness. If they are responsive, if you were to do a pupillary reflex test and they could respond to that, uh, that is a type of responsiveness. The body is also has adaptability. Uh, we are adaptive. That means if you were to change the temperature in the room, their body could adapt to that. Um, if that person is not alive, they're not going to be able to adapt at all. Uh, growth is something that happens, at least growth of hair, growth of nails, uh, growth of certain tissues. We do stop growing. Uh, us as humans have determinate growth. We don't get any taller after we reach uh, puberty uh, and we've stopped growing. 
Now, reproduction, we at least have the ability to. Now, I like to emphasize that. I have never reproduced, though I am 37 years of age. I have never reproduced. I've not had children, but I am still alive. Uh, but we have the ability to reproduce. Movement is also something. If you were to take, uh, during an examination, if you were to take... Uh, the uh, hammer for a reflex test to someone and they produce a reflexive movement uh, or other kinds of movements, withdrawal and movements from a painful stimulus, things like that. Are they breathing on their own? Are they able to respire uh, breathing? Are they capable of doing chemical reactions of the body? Are they able to digest food? Can they do metabolism? Is their body able to produce energy for them without you uh, somehow intervening. So that patient is on a, um, a ventilator, uh, they may be able to do the other things, but if they are no longer to breathe on their own, uh, and actually we kind of define generally in most cases uh, the, per the time they stop breathing is the moment of death. So as we think about that, we also, if we know what life uh, has, what is the characteristics of life, let's also see what it is they need. Because if I were to take and deny a body these materials for a certain amount of time, for somewhere between three, um, uh, three minutes to three days or even three uh, months, that person will be deceased. So that rule of three somewhat, and it doesn't fit perfectly, but if you remove these things from a person's body, they will die if they are not getting it. If they're not getting oxygen, if they're not receiving enough O2 in their body to sustain life, they will die, and they will die very quickly within minutes. Food and nutrients must be provided uh, water must be provided. Uh, the right amount of ions, acids, and bases always must be present in their body. For example, sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions, magnesium, chloride, etc., etc., etc. All these different ions must be present. And then there will be the organic compounds we need that we'll talk about later on some other lectures. And we'll talk about ions in the second chapter. But these are things like your carbohydrates, your proteins, your lipids, your nucleic acids. ATP, ADP, your high energy compounds, other high energy compounds. For those of you who are taking some advanced level courses, you might be familiar with some other high energy compounds out there. So let's take a look at how we build a human body. And we'll be drawing in some things in, later on in this lecture. But right now, we want to kind of get started of we have a human body, a human, an organism, a human body and we want to build them up and we want to start at the smallest things we can really think of and we're going to begin here with the smallest our subatomic particles and these would be things like your protons your neutrons and your electrons remember these are the particles that produce an atom where the atomic level being made up of subatomic particles is the simplest stable unit of matter you cannot have a smaller unit of matter than the atom then the atoms, two or more atoms, can be bonded together to make a chemical. And that would be your, now atoms being the simplest unit of a chemical, if I group groups of atoms, two or more atoms, and I bond together, I can make chemicals or molecules, larger molecules I'm lumping in there. That includes your macromolecules out there, things like proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, very large organic compounds would be included there. Cells. If we take atoms, molecules, and then we take the things called organelles, which we'll get into organelles uh, many times. We'll take chemicals and organelles. The textbook we're using doesn't, so I'm kind of following the link there, but I like to mention the organelles present so the students will understand that connection. So they are there. Our book just does not do a very good job of, of emphasizing that, but uh, given that, be, be aware that they are there before uh, that cells contain those organelles, and those organelles are made of molecules, and the cell is the simplest unit of life. So it is the smallest thing that can do all of these things, okay? Cells, smallest thing can do all those things. Now, tissues... They are going to be a bunch of cells working together. They have a similar function. Think of these cells as either one, uh, one type of cell or many types of cells that come together that have the same function. They are working together. For example, in the human body, we have four types, the epithelial tissues, as you might know. 
they line body surfaces inside and out. Well, that is more so later on in some other content that I probably will do. Uh, connective tissues, things that either hold the body together, help transport materials, store, things like that. A variety of functions connective tissues do. Muscle tissues to produce movement or your nervous or neural tissues, which are there to control the body. And we understand that those tissues all have unique jobs and they may contain different types of cells. Now, organs are going to be made up of a variety of different tissues. So you may have an organ like the stomach who contains all tissues. All those tissues would be somewhere on the stomach. Uh, then you may have, for example, neural tissue, connective tissues, and epithelia to make some of your neural organs. So you have, to some degree, a little bit of everything uh, present uh, in, in those organs. And that's also one of the things that makes the tissues such a difficult thing in labs for students to understand is that the tissues you're looking at in a lab is a sample of an organ, and that organ is made up of different tissues. Now, if I were to take all the organs that we have that are in one system, we'd have an organ system. For example, if I took every organ for digestion that was involved in digesting, we would have the digestive system. If I took every organ involved in controlling the body using neurons, we'd have the nervous system. If I had everything that would be found uh, in, your, in your bones, we'd have skeletal system. So the systems, organ systems, they are different organs who all work together. Um, and you have 11 different organ systems we're going to talk about. And then if I take all 11 organ systems and combine them together, all working together, we have you. We have your patient. We have the person you love the most in this world, your mother, your grandmother, your father, your grandfather, brother, sister, cousin, your husband, your wife. The person you love the most is a human organism. That is potentially uh, somebody's patient. Every patient that you ever have, never forget this, is uh, a human being, is another person like you was scared. Uh, never forget that. Uh, that's part of the reason uh, so many people uh, mess up, is they just forget that they're working on a fellow human being. All right, so as you can see, we can go into atoms, subatomic particles to make more complex chemicals, to even more complex cellular tissues, organs, one organ system, and all the organ systems together to make up an organism, an individual made up of every single organ system that there is in the human body. Um, now, something big that I want to emphasize here, and this really, as short of a statement it is, is quite an in-depth thing, but the chemical cause of many diseases, it, it, it's a huge thing. Very small levels of organization, like for the chemistry, can have dramatic impacts for the whole body. For example, if at the protein level something is not right, didn't fold into the correct structure, we have a mutation in the DNA, we have too many acids and not enough bases, or too many bases, not enough acids, not enough ions, too many ions. The chemistry is off and can result in severe disease, uh, high glucose levels, things like that. So really so many diseases out there begin at the chemistry and will be treated with the chemistry. So think about that. When you alter something very small, it really has huge impacts as you go further. It just almost magnifies those problems at higher levels uh, of organization. So going from the chemical to the cell, to the tissue, to the organ, to the organ system and organism, you're compounding sometimes these problems, uh, and that can be quite fatal. Now, I want to give a very brief introduction in this lecture to 11 body systems. This is something we will spend every lecture really looking at more in depth. But let's give us a good, just basic backdrop understanding and that of our 11. And I'm going to start by just listing them and saying we have the integumentary system, skeletal, muscular, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive. Now, each of these systems are made up of major organs with major functions. Now, there are other organs and there are other functions, 
but we're going to look at their major thing to get a good idea of what's happening. And we want to start with the integumentary system, which mainly includes our skin, which can put uh, a broad category, our skin. And this helps control body temperature, like when you sweat, uh, you get goosebumps. Uh, it helps prevent infections. It's going to act as a physical barrier to disease, something we'll talk about in the immune system. The skeletal system is made up of all those bones, the 206 bones that you have in your body. Each of those are an organ that is going to be contributing to the skeletal system. And it supports, it protects the body, but it also helps make your blood cells, and something we'll talk about in the blood lecture. Muscular system contains all those skeletal muscles, and what we're going to see with that is your muscular system supports uh, your body, for example, the pelvic floor muscles, the um, abdominal wall muscles. They help support. They produce movement. Uh, of course, your major muscles move your body, and they generate body heat. But we're talking about skeletal muscles here, the muscles on the skeleton, the over 660-some-odd muscles that you have in a human body are going to be those muscles. Now, your nervous system contains mainly your brain and spinal cord, and then every other nervous tissue in your body is component of nervous system. Um, and as we look at that, the job of this is really control body function, uh, detecting stimuli and regulating the body in response to that stimuli. It's looking at something's happened in the body. I need to do something about it. But there is a second system who also controls the body, endocrine. But it has the glands, many of the body's glands. That would be things like the thyroid gland, the pancreas, the uh, um, thymus, the uh, variety of glands that we've seen, our adrenal glands, etc. And they control the body as well, but they use hormones and we're going to see some of the differences in hormones if uh, whenever we look at the uh, tissues lecture for our lab series that I'll try to do as well so cardiovascular system is basically your heart's arteries and veins uh, heart and blood vessels and it just transports things throughout the body I mean it contains blood it contains a variety of tissues but it's what transports through the body lymphatic is all about things like your lymph nodes your spleen and your tonsils these are just a few of the major ones of course there are many other organs and we'll get in when we do lymphatics and immunity we'll discuss that but they fight infections and they return fluids back to your bloodstream when your capillaries deliver nutrients to tissues in your bloodstream there is fluid loss and i need to return that respiratory system is going to be things like your lungs, your airways, and your nose. So your nasal cavities, your lungs, all your airways, trachea, bronchi, etc. And it's all there about gas exchange, getting gases to my body to keep me alive, providing those gases needed uh, to sustain life digestive system has things like your stomach your liver and your intestines both large and small and this processes your nutrients it absorbs those nutrients it's going to take things that can sustain a body a living organism and bring that in process it absorb it so that it can be utilized by your body to grow and do things you need to do Urinary system is going to mainly contain things like kidney and bladder. Your two kidneys, your bladder, um, there's a variety of other organs in there, absolutely. And that is one of the most difficult sections in AMP2, I think, is urinary. And it's going to help us remove waste from our body. And then reproductive, that's going to have genitalia, your genitals, that is, um, of course, the penis and the vagina, uh, and then the gonads, the testes and ovaries. And they're there to make sex cells, sperm and egg, and sex hormones, things like testosterone, progesterone, estrogens in the body. So, depending on your uh, biological sex, uh, what you're going to be producing there. So as you look at that, you could see every system here listed out in the same order. And each of those with the major organs. Now, I don't list every single organ here. I just really wanted to give a very brief intro to this because we're going to spend multiple lectures on that. 
All right, so it's very important that we understand that there are two systems that we have that control the body. Now, you might remember the fable, Aesop's fable, about the tortoise and the hare. And I don't know if you guys know the tortoise and the hare. A tortoise is a very slow-moving reptile, a turtle, very slow-moving. And then a hare is a rabbit. Rabbits are very fast-moving. And you might remember that the nervous system is a lot like the hare, the rabbit. He acts quickly, but he is done very fast. He only lasts for short term. He is quick to start, but fast to, fast to finish. He is a lot like that hare, the rabbit. He is very fast, and he is done quickly. So remember the rabbit, he went on, realized he was so far away from the tortoise, uh, that he decided to take a nap. But the tortoise was slow and steady. Slow and steady won the, the race. So they are very long-term controls and for long duration. So they are slow to act and long to last. It takes a long time generally for endocrine to be able to function, to get started. But once it does, it goes for the long term. This would be for things like puberty, uh, controlling blood pressures uh, for the long term, controlling many things in the body, development, growth, um, pubescence, as we said, variety of important things the endocrine system controls, like metabolism, things that need to be controlled for a long time. So nervous system, endocrine, the difference, and they both control, but very different. Now, the first thing that we're actually going to be drawing uh, in a minute is dealing with this central concept homeostasis homeostasis is the central principle it is the most important principle that i can first teach you in your very early things because in healthcare, what you're going to be looking at is how can i stabilize my patient my patient's been in a car wreck my patient is injured my patient is bleeding what can i do to stabilize them so what is this well it's a stable state a steady state homeo means same stasis stable or standing same. Um, think about this as same or stable. We want to be stabilized, standing steady. Um, we want to have a constant internal environment, a steady state. We want to always be in that happy area. Now, there's really two ways that we regulate things in homeostasis. What we call regulation, which is either autoregulation or intrinsic because it's within the organ, or extrinsic is outside the organ now auto regulation or intrinsic is going to be within the system being regulated for example if kidneys need blood flow and kidney releases chemicals that makes blood flow increase to kidney that's intrinsic if heart is releasing things to itself to impact itself um, then that would be intrinsic. Intrinsic is within the organs or the body system that is being regulated. So if heart is helping to regulate blood pressure, intrinsic. Now, case in point, what if we were to bring another system involved? Well, if we got another system involved, another organ or organ system involved, that'd be extrinsic because it's from outside, extra outside. So like extra credit would be outside credit. Extrinsic is outside organs. So this would be like if your body is getting cold and you get your muscles start to contract uh, and other things, you also behaviorally put on more warm clothes and start a fire. Um, or you have uh, uh, some other system like endocrine system and nervous system working in conjunction extrinsically because the other system is outside that system. So when they control something like cardiovascular system, um, digestive system, that would be extrinsic because they are outside the systems. So when nervous system or endocrine system helps regulate, that's the type of extrinsic control. Now, a few words we need to understand is... What is uh, feedback systems involving? The players of the feedback. The four major components to a feedback system is a stimulus, 
a receptor, a control center, and an effector. Now, this is an order of arriving. Now, we're going to use the analogy here from my notes right now of a thermostat inside of a building. And in this thermostat, we set a temperature that we think is the optimal temperature for that room. And right now, it is summertime where I am teaching and presenting this. I'm recording right now in the dead of summer. And, and we want this nice and cool in this room. The air conditioner is set. Now, what's going to happen if I set this room to a comfortable temperature for me? The heat from outside coming through the windows in my office here is going to heat the air up. And that air being heat up will then go into a thermometer inside this guy, inside this thermostat or in the room somewhere. And that's going to heat up this and saying, wait a minute, it is now hot than what my air conditioner is set on and that will cause the air conditioner to turn on to release cool air into the room slowly dropping it till we're back to normal temperature now once that temperature is normalized the heat from outside again will heat this room up till eventually it's a warm enough for the control center to perceive it it will turn it back on and the temperature in this room will fluctuate up and down now we might have said that 22 degrees celsius is the temperature we want this to but it might go up closer to 30 degrees celsius and might go down closer to 10 degrees or 20 15 degrees celsius depending on what the, I know it's not going to go down to 10 degrees it's awfully cold so what we're going to do is we have our set temperature and it goes up maybe to uh, 25 degrees and maybe down to 20 uh, or 19 degrees so it's going to range up and down but that is going to be a range a normal set now the stimulus is the change in something being regulated so the temperature of the room when it got hot that became the stimulus and that was perceived by a receptor somewhere who detects that and the receptor says yes it is now warmer and that information is sent to the thermostat somewhere to say you need to turn on the air conditioning and the air conditioning comes on that being our effector now the same kind of thing let's say that i went out and i ate a dozen chocolate covered custard filled donuts and these dozen chocolate covered custard filled donuts are so full of sugar that my blood sugar is immensely high and the stimulus of the rising blood sugar will be detected by the body. Uh, the receptors oftentimes, of course, are going to be up in the pancreas inside the beta cells. And that's perceived actually in the same location. The effector cell, the pancreas, will release hormones to change that and to lower the blood sugar back down. Now, your body has a set point. Here we decided that set point was 22 degrees Celsius for the room. Well, my body's set point for glucose is about 70 to 110, uh, 90 to 110 mil equivalents. I apologize, uh, 90 to 110 mil equivalents for uh, uh, your uh, uh, glucose levels, uh, mil, uh, milligrams per deciliter uh, for uh, glucose. And what's happening is that range, if it's too low or too high, will be out of range and will disturb the stimulus so disturbing that will cause a feedback system to be kicking into gear so let's take a look at the two types and that's where we're going to draw this out and we're going to immediately go into this right now and discuss this as if um the um and i am trying to get a handle on uh, um on this new setup uh, that I'm using to draw. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to use the palette. All right, so I'm going to move to my other capturing here. Uh, and uh, we're going to draw this out. So let's take a look at the two different types. So the two different types, we have negative and positive feedback. Um, we're going to start with negative first. Negative feedback 
and then we'll go to positive feedback. Now remember we have a stimulus and in this case let's make our stimulus red and with our red stimulus let's say with a negative feedback the stimulus let's say the stimulus were to go up the body so this s right an s there for stimulus the body needs to go up so uh the uh stimulus has gone up the body needs to respond to that the body responds the opposite direction the body response will be opposite to that now so what you will see in negative feedback the stimulus and the body's response must always go in opposite directions case in point if the stimulus were to drop below normal the body would need to respond to raise it back up so my black line here is referencing my normal range my normal range for something so in negative feedback you have the stimulus going in the opposite directions to body response they must go opposite now what about positive in positive feedback if the stimulus were to go up if we had an increase in the stimulus the body would respond to make things worse the stimulus in the body's response would go in the same direction if the stimulus were to decrease the body's response would further to decrease it given that we have a stimulus in the body's response here during a positive feedback the stimulus if it goes up the body's response will go the same the stimulus oh, let me go up oh, went that way the wrong way there we go sorry the stimulus in the body's response it's not gonna let me <laughs> do that I guess I got a little too close will go in the same direction they are same direction so what we're dealing with here is in a positive feedback loop sorry about that in a positive feedback loop we are going to see the stimulus and the body's response go in the same direction it will push to completion worsening the disturbance takes us away from homeostasis negative feedback the stimulus and the body response go in opposite direction this always brings us back so i always say that positive pushes to completion negative negates the stimulus but anytime i ever mess this up i'm going to have a disease uh, for example diabetes is a loss of homeostasis of glucose where glucose is going to be too high um, so when you have these kinds of issues that's going to happen now here's some examples that I've compiled of positive feedback for example if you're gonna if mama's gonna make milk uh, generally she will do milk production until baby is done at least in humans the childbirth contractions chi uh, contractions get worse until the baby's out baby's been delivered fever virus or bacteria causes the body to re, uh, raise its temperature until the enemy is destroyed it gets worse before it gets better in a positive feedback negative feedback for example if blood pressure goes up body releases hormones to lower it the opposite is true blood pressure goes down body releases hormones to raise it o2 levels if i have low oxygen i'm going to start breathing deeper and faster um and thirst sensation if i'm dehydrated i get thirsty and then i get hydrated again so this undoes that so uh that really takes us out of that first major unit section there where we are discussing the central core principles and terminologies to understand anatomy and physiology and their central principles now we're moving into how we describe human bodies and how we think about human bodies and the first thing we always want to do is give ourselves a common frame of reference 
a standard to talk about the body. And to do that, you need an anatomical position. Uh, the individual in my diagram here is standing in an anatomical position where they are. They're standing facing upright. They are upright. They are facing forward. They are Their arms are out to their side with their palms facing forward to me, but their feet are together. They are in the anatomical position. Now, anytime you ever have a patient and you want to chart about their wound location or where something was found, you have to use this as the reference. You can't talk about any other directional terms without imagining the patient like this. If this patient is uh, wherever they're lying, however they're lying, you need to imagine them like this. If they are in an accident and their body is twisted and mangled, you in your mind have to put them like this to describe where things are. Now, if they're on their back, we could say that they are supine when they're on their back because that's when they're on their back. You can feed them soup. If they're laying on their belly, they are prone. When someone shoots a, a rifle lying on their belly, they are in the prone position. So prone. Now, some other big words that we need to make sure we understand are words like anterior and posterior. Anterior simply just means the front of the body, where posterior means the backside or behind. Posterior is behind you. Now, I'm going to say backside, not back, or behind. Now, ventral means belly. Now, the thing about the human body is that we are bipedal. We stand on two legs, and because we are bipedal, our belly is on the front. So that makes the word ventral identical to anterior because our belly is on the front. And in human body, because we are bipedal, our back is behind us. Our back is, is posterior. So dorsal, the word that means back, is an equivalent term to our uh, posterior. So in humans, it would be that way, not in your cat or dog, not in the animals on your farm, uh, not in anything that's a quadruped, but on bipedal uh, organisms like us, our ventral is, uh, is anterior, our dorsal is posterior. All right, here's some other that I want to talk about, some very big ones that you will use a lot. These are not every one of them that our book does go through, but these are the big ones we will discuss often. Uh, one of those is, uh, we're going to start on the front side. We'll talk about the word cephalic, head. When you hear the word like cephalized, cephalic, uh, like hydrocephaly, uh, water on the, on the brain. Cephalic means head. Oral. Oral means mouth. Oral surgery is done in the mouth. Mental means chin. Think about it when you're really trying to think seriously about something. You might put your hands on your chin. You might rub on your chin or put your hands on your chin to think when you're in deep mental thought. Mental. Axillary is the armpit. Axilla armpit. That's actually why the spray used by teenagers in America, Axe Body Spray, uh, is named that after the axilla. Pectoral means chest. Costal means ribs. Brachial deals with the arm. The humerus is actually, when we anatomically talk about the arm, we're talking about the thing from the shoulder to the elbow. Anticubital is the front of the elbow. That's the anticubital fossa. That's where the median cubital uh, vein would be, where you would take a lot of blood from. Car uh, antibrachial is your forearm. That would be from the elbow down to the wrist. Carpal's the wrist. Carpal's the wrist. Think about it. carpal wrist. Antibrachial forearm. Tarsal. That's your ankle. Uh, the uh, tarsal is referencing the ankles. Um, your pedal or pedal region is your foot. Think about you pedal a bicycle with your foot. Femoral, that would be your thigh where your femur is. Pubic region is the pubis. It's down there where uh, human beings, where we get pubic hair uh, growing on our bodies upon puberty uh, is the pubic region. Inguinal, that would be your groin. Uh, that's where men get inguinal hernias. The navel or belly button is called our umbilical region. The abdomen is the abdominal. 
your thoracic means chest. Thoracic, that's the chest. That's going to be containing like heart and lungs. Cervical, in this case, means neck. Now, there's a question I oftentimes put on my quizzes or examinations of is uh, a cervical lesion could be in the female reproductive system or where else? Well, cervical is not, cervix is not just a part of the female reproductive tract uh, associated to as a part of her uterus, but this is also the neck of a human. Otic, ear, otoscopes are used to look inside the ear. The otic membrane, otolith, things like that. Ear, otic. Ocular means eye. Like binoculars are a thing you use to look through to see things. Now remember, the word dorsal on the back is identical to posterior. Your dorsal is your back. Your lower back is called your lumbar or loin. Gluteal is your buttocks, your buttocks. Your popliteal is the area under your knee. And the calcaneal, calcaneal, heel, and plantar bottom of your foot. That's where you get plantar warts or plantar fasciitis. So uh, my human anatomy professor uh, would never allow us to use the word Achilles tendon. We had to call it the calcanean tendon. Because as he told us, we are in human anatomy, not Greek mythology. And this is the tendon on the hill, on the calcaneus. So these are important terms we use a lot. Here is all of them that our book does cover. Uh, a few extra things, but I wanted to cover some things like I didn't do digit, uh, hallux, uh, pollux, palmer, uh, things like that. Uh, that I potentially may need to talk about. All right, something else we're going to be drawing here in just a minute is the abdominopelvic regions and quadrants. And we're going to begin with quadrant because these are the simplest. Um, and as we talk about these, what you're basically going to be doing is imagining in a, a human body where, um, so we're going to take a, a human body here, let's say our torso of a normal human. So let's draw this person's belly button. That would be the navel. And we're going to take in red, I'm going to draw a line directly down the middle there, horizontally through the horizontal plane, and another one straight through the middle the other way, representing um, one, two, three, four quadrants. Now, this anatomically is the right side of the body. Though it is the left side of the screen, it is right side of the body. And this side over here is the left side of the body, though it is the right side of the screen. And this would be the upper part of the body, upper half. And this would be the lower half of the body. So this makes this guy here the right upper quadrant. Now I'm not going to write the whole word in, I'm just going to abbreviate it. And this makes this one here the left upper quadrant. Sometimes I try to write and this thing just does not read very well. It's the app that I'm using and that's, that's okay. It's all right. Um, we're going to use our color wheel. I prefer that. Um, I don't know why sometimes this thing just does not want uh, to do the thing that it is supposed to do. Okay, left upper quadrant. There is also a right lower quadrant and a left lower quadrant. And what you've done, what we've done here is is separated four anatomical regions or quadrants through the abdominopelvic region. Uh, going two lines, going across the belly button, separating one vertically, one horizontally. Uh, this is the one that most clinicians will use. This is more so of a uh, clinical examination more commonly used. Um, so we have those, uh, and I, uh, what I drew out with you. Now the other one we're going to look at is the abdominal pelvic region. This is more used by anatomists, like those who are in instruction, 
those are in more in research. And there are nine of these, and what we're going to be doing with this guy is we are going to make more of a, uh, uh, I like to say it looks like a tic-tac-toe board that we're going to put. If you're not from America, you may not have played the game tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is, um, is a game kids play. So here we have our abdomen again. Uh, our belly button but what we're going to do with this one is we're going to draw a line across here and here and then here and here like a tic-tac-toe board and this is created one two three four five six seven eight nine different regions now, also, just for edification, I'm going to use blue, and I'm going to dot a line here and dot a line here, representing ribs. Uh, let, we might as well just try to get that in there as good as possible. Um, and um, uh, sometimes I just do not know why this thing does the things it does. It is frustrating, to say the least, that my palette makes me do the way it does on this app. Okay, so there we go. We got that. Now, what we're going to be dealing with is there is one called, uh, because it's below the ribs, uh, cartilage hypochondriac. Uh, so there is a, uh, a right... And a left hypochondriac. And I'm just going to abbreviate that hypo. Um, in the middle here we have the umbilical. Which above the umbilical you would have the. Because if it's above that, upon that, it's epigastric. And below the umbilical is hypogastric. Hypogastric. On each side of the umbilical is your lumbars, and on each side of the hypogastric, um, you have your inguinal. Uh, now, sometimes hypogastric is called pubic. All right, so let's take a look at that on here again, just so we could see those. Um, regions outlined there so there are uh left and right hypochondriac left and right lumbars left and right inguinals and then the epigastric umbilical and hypogastrics in the middle so these are primarily used in uh, for anatomists who are more researched now this is what's going on so if we take the blue quadrant here and we were to imagine and doctor starts to push and he's describing that there is pain in the right upper quadrant of the patient uh, that might be signifying issues with the liver gallbladder things like that and depending on where at he pushes that um, also we describe with the abdominal pelvic regions as well so pain presents upon palpation what you might feel is it distended is it enlarged things like that where is the pain felt this is all used in diagnoses and your typical examinations. Now, as well, we go into sexual anatomy, and sexual anatomy is looking at the body in slices. And one of these things we want to look at is there is what we call the body has three axes. Now, kind of to explain the three axes of a body, I want to kind of try to draw this out a little bit with you guys and help you understand it. Um, and um, let's take a look at that. So what you would have is in three dimensions, there is an axis that goes across, which we would think of as our x-axis. And then there also is an axis that goes up and down that we may think of as our y-axis. And uh, we're going to visualize that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, Should have done it that way. There we go. And then there is 
another one that comes out, uh, and we call that the z-axis. So if we have the one that comes out uh, in front of us here, uh, x, y, and z-axis, uh, like that, and I didn't draw it the best I possibly could, I apologize, uh, but that's going to help us understand what's going on there. Now, sections are slices made in these planes, and we use that to look inside the body using things like MRI, PET scans, CT scans that are used. Now, the planes, you have what is called the transverse that cuts the body, separates body from top to bottom. We call that a cross-section, and that goes from top to bottom. Then there's sagittal. That separates left from right. Now, if you are equally between left and right, right between the eyes, you're called a mid-sagittal section. If you are unequally, like uh, if you were to go on the left eye and try to do a section of the left eye, we would have a parasagittal section. Frontal section, also called coronal, separates us front to back, uh, anterior from posterior. So let's take a look at this. Here we have those three planes I was trying to draw. The transverse plane is the green, our sagittal plane in blue, and our purple plane here is coronal. Uh, coronal frontal, sagittal blue, transverse green, and you would see that transverse separates me top from bottom, whereas sagittal left from right, whereas frontal coronal front to back. Now, if you were to do this sagittal plane unequally here, it wouldn't be dead between the eyes. It would be here. So, um, all right. And here I've got a very interesting, and I've given the link to it down the bottom uh, uh, from a, a health and medicine site showing a, a complete human body from top to bottom, showing our transverse section. So you can actually see that used. Uh, this was a scan of a cadaver, um, a male cadaver. All right, so some other very important things that we need to discuss here are some important terms. These terms are things like your uh, the directional anatomy. Anything that goes in an upward direction on human body is going superiorly, but since it's going upwards and our head is upwards, we call this cranial or cephalic because the word cephalic means head as well. You could actually use that as another alternate term. We go downwards is inferior. Inferior goes towards our tail region, which is referred to as being our caudal region. Um, and then if we move towards the front or something's on the front as anterior, another word for that ventral. Ventral means belly and anterior the same word. Uh, dorsal meaning back or posterior being equivalent terms. Posterior is behind in human body. Those are the same. Now here's some very important words. If I imagine a midline separating the body in half, that midline, if something is towards that midline, it is said to be medial direction. If it moves away from that midline, it's lateral. For example, this would be the medial side of the forearm. This would be the lateral side of the forearm. This would be the medial side of the eye, lateral side of the eye. Ears are located laterally. Uh, now, if we start at a point of attachment, for example, here at the hip, and I move towards the ankle to the toes, etc., we begin here at the point of attachment. This is called the proximal end, nearest to its point of attachment. If we move further from the point of attachment, I'm going distally. Distally is going further away. You're going to becoming distant. If you approximate, you're trying to get close. Proximal is close. Distal is distant. Superficial is anything that is going to be near the body's surfaces. And deep is anything that's far from the surface. So if you go for a deep muscle, you're going to be going closer to the bone. If you're going for a superficial muscle, you're going to be going closer to the skin. Now, some important terms that we also are going to look at, and this uh, is about where we begin to end our cells, um, is getting into body cavities and the organs in them, is there are three major body cavities that are associated to the body, to, uh, one of which is kind of a subpart of another, but I need to talk about it as it is a separate thing because it is so clinically relevant. 
but the dorsal body cavity, the one on the back, contains brain and spinal cord. If Now, it has two subdivisions. Dorsal body cavity has a cranial cavity that holds the brain. Spinal cavity holds your spinal cord. Makes sense. Cranial cavity and spinal cavity are two subdivisions of dorsal body cavity. The ventral body cavity we refer to as the coelom. It is on the front side. Uh, it's separated in half by the diaphragm. Everything above the diaphragm in the ventral body cavity is called thoracic. It's the chest above diaphragm. If you're below the diaphragm, you're abdominal pelvic. Now, thoracic cavity above diaphragm has got two separate cavities. The two pleural cavities, which the lungs are held in, and the pericardial cavity holding the heart. Those are the two separate thoracic divisions. Now, mediastinum is actually surrounding the pericardial cavity and between the pleural cavity, so it is technically a subdivision inside a ventral, but we're going to separate it out as its own specific cavity um, as it's clinically relevant, uh, so clinically important. I feel like it's necessary to do that but just mention where it is and then we fix that problem. Now the abdominal pelvic cavity is below the diaphragm and it holds the abdominal cavity and the pelvic, hence abdominal pelvic. Uh, the digestive organs here that would be located inside the abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity holds your reproductive and bladder. Um, so, and then mediastinum, we said between the two lungs, between the pleural cavities and surrounding the pericardial. So these are all inside of here, and you can actually see mediastinum here, pleural cavities holding the lungs, pericardial cavity holding the heart, mediastinum is all that between the lungs surrounding pericardial cavity. Um, now, something also very important to discuss, and I'm going to draw this out, so we're going to go and look at that, is, um, I clicked the wrong thing there, uh, so sometimes it gets a little uh easy to do okay so let's go in and draw uh something out here i'm going to draw a big circle and this big circle here is going to reference my body cavity okay and then just for um edification we're going to use this to represent an organ uh any kind of organ here uh, heart. I'm just representing a visceral organ here. Now, visceral organs, they are surrounded by many of them by double layered membranes called serous membranes. And serous membranes being double layered sealed membranes have two layers on them. One layer is always going to be close and associated to the organ where the other one is going to be closer to the body wall, even fused to body wall sometimes. So what you have is the outer layer associated to the body wall or near the body wall on the outer side is called the parietal layer. The parietal layer. The inner layer that's going to be on the organ itself is called the visceral layer. All serous membranes have these two layers on them. All serous membranes have them. Um, and there's different types of serous membranes. So let's take a look at these different types of serous membranes. Uh, so all serous membranes have a visceral layer and a parietal layer. Uh, remember, visceral layer is closest to the organs, the viscera. The parietal layer is always going to be either closest to or even attached to the muscular body wall, for example, on the inside of the ribs. Now, thoracic cavity has a pleura and a pericardium. The two membranes Pleura is, it has a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura, is in the pleural cavity and is surrounding your lungs. Pericardium, which here is a visceral pericardium and a parietal pericardium, we'll discuss these all more in detail in uh, the AMP2 lectures, and they are located in pericardial cavities surrounding the heart, pericardium, cardio heart. Abdominal pelvic cavity holds our peritoneum. There's a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum in the abdominal pelvic cavity sealing those organs. 
So as you can actually see, thoracic cavity has your pleural around the lungs and pericardial around the heart. There is the abdominal pelvic cavity, with uh, which we have the region called a peritoneal cavity that I need to uh, uh, kind of further um, uh, further take, uh, which we call the abdominal cavity or peritoneal cavity. I just need to take that abdominal cavity and put peritoneal in there. Peritoneal cavity is the space between there, pelvic cavity, abdominal cavity. I need to put that peritoneal cavity in there. Uh, in my notes, and I apologize for lacking that out. Uh, and you could see those cavities in thoracic as well. All right, now just to let you know, the heart, lungs, larynx, and trachea primarily are going to be sitting associated with thoracic cavity or portions of it, where the abdominal pelvic contains your liver, your gallbladder, your stomach, your pancreas, your spleen, your large and small intestines, your bladder and kidneys. So the major organs associated to these have an idea where they are. It's important that we know uh, these will be looked at more in depth and their locations will be more described later on. Uh, now I put these in for review so if you're watching you want to pause and take a moment uh, to test your knowledge. If you pause and then we'll come right back and we'll take a look at the answers. All right, so if you pause, here we are. And notice I really didn't pause it myself. Um, so A, we're looking at, uh, we could be saying that we have our superior direction here, uh, cranial region. Um, B, we're looking at uh, the inferior direction. And if you're looking for the answers, uh, they're actually right here. Uh, or supposed to have been right here. Uh, I think they're trying to say superior and inferior uh, on those, or, or they uh, looking at the views it was kind of hard for me to tell. Uh, so I'm going to say A, superior, B, inferior uh, for mine. Uh, then uh, what we're looking at, uh, C, uh, C would be posterior or dorsal, D, anterior or ventral, uh, E, moving in superior or cranial direction, so we could say cranially. Uh, F, inferiorly or caudally. Uh, G, we're moving in, that's lateral. H, medial. I, proximal. And J, distal. So if you're practicing it, uh, same things here. All right, this concludes my very first lecture. I hope you guys find these helpful. Please let me know um, if there's something I can do to improve this. Uh, I'm going to make every one of these available within my uh, on a Facebook page that I run so that you can download the notes and watch these with me. Uh, but please don't forget to subscribe. Hit that like button. Let me know of future things you would like to see for me to do, uh, what I can do with, with materials I have at hand. But thank you so much for watching. and. Thank you all.